Welcome to Epic Ministries. I'm Alan LaChapelle. And today I'm going to do a standalone uh, teaching, and it's found in the book of Acts, chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and find that place, Acts, chapter 3, verse 19. Now before we get into that, let's do uh, uh, a little bit of a background. The beginning of that chapter, you have Peter and you have John that head off to the temple for a prayer meeting. And they encounter a man who was born lame. The man never walked. He was, he was lame from his mother's womb. And they fasten their eyes on this gentleman. And they say, gold and silver we don't have, but what we do have we give unto you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And they, Peter takes his hand out, grabs the man's hand, lifts him up. And as he lifts him up, strength comes into his leg. He begins to walk and leap and jump and rejoice and praise God. And as do many people. So it gives Peter an opportunity to preach the gospel, which he does. And so verse 19 is the end of that preaching, the conclusion of that preaching. So let's go through verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So let's start at the word repent. The most important word in the Bible, repent. There's no more important word in the Bible, found in the Bible, than the word repent concerning mankind, concerning you, concerning me. Repent simply means change your thinking. Change your thinking. And it deals with the will of man. See. When God created man, he made him in his image and after his likeness. Well, what's God? God's a spiritual being, so you were created a spiritual being. That's only part of it. The other part is God is, has the ability to make choices and decisions. God has the ability to make choices and decisions. He has given us the ability to make choices and decisions, like he can. Now, I think about this. Angels don't have the right to make choices and decisions. They are servants. They are given an assignment and they are expected to fulfill that assignment. But you and I have been given free moral, we're free moral agents and we have the right to make decisions. Which in a perfect world is a perfect thing, but in the broken world it can be a problem. But God doesn't take that right away from us even though mankind messed it up. That right is still there and available for us. And so it deals with the will of man. Now, how we process information is important to understand because we all process information differently all of us in the same way that we have special our DNA is unique and different from any other person in the world our ability to process information is different from anybody else in the world and we process information through a filter of ideology and theology when you say well I'm not I'm not even religious it doesn't make any difference. You have ideology or you have theology. You may be the God of this world to yourself. It doesn't make any difference. Everybody has a filter of ideology and theology. And everything, all the information we receive is filtered through that. Everything gets filtered through that ideology, that filter. Everything. Everything. Now, if in a perfect world, there's no problem. Because in a perfect world, God gives the information. He speaks his word, which is truth, which is information. And we have a filter, our ideological filter, a theological filter that we filter that word through. And God, through, through on us through experience, know that if God speaks it, that it's manifested on the earth, that everything lines up with it. But we live not in a perfect world, but a very much imperfect world. We live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that has a sin nature in it. We live, we have a flesh of body that comes from this world that also has a sin nature in it, wants to do its own thing. And we live in a world where the devil speaks his lies because he's the father of lies. So now instead of one voice of information, we have four voices of information. And sometimes that's like kind of all melded together. And it's, it's challenging to figure out what's, what's the truth. And we can see that in our world today. There's, there's, it's very challenging for people 
to figure out what the truth is. Is their truth, my truth, your truth, everybody's truth. There's only one truth, and that's the truth of the Word of God and what God has to say and what Jesus has to say. So, we take this information and we process it. And, but the problem is we have these filters. We have this filter, an ideologi ideological filter and a theological filter. And it's there. God knows that. God understands that. God is quite aware of that. So God has set a reset button. When man fell, he set a reset button, and his name is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth is the reset button. Jesus came and lived a life on planet Earth and gave his life for us and spoke and taught and did actions that pertain to the will of God for us. So we can see in Jesus' life his perfect will, his perfect word for us. He's the reset button. He's the button that resets everything for us, for those who believe. And remember, the gospel has to be believed in order to be received. You have to believe on it. And that comes from your will, which takes us back to the word repent. Change the way you think. That's the reset button that God has given us. We have the ability to change the way we think. Now, why is that so important? Because God deals with our will first. If we don't yield our will to the will of God, then God can't really do anything, even though he's done everything. Jesus has come. Jesus has lived. Jesus has died. Jesus has been raised again. We have eternal life. We have the ability to have eternal life in us by believing on the gospel. But he's not going to make us do that. He's not going to force us to do that. He's going to let us choose because we are free moral agents to choose right and wrong. We can choose, and that's what he wants us to do. That's why the word repent, the word repent, the most important word for mankind is there. God has called us to repent, change the way we think, because he understands that the filters that we have, the ideological filter and the theological filters that we have there in place, but that can be overcome because the word of God is there through Jesus. Jesus becomes the go-to person. Jesus becomes the one that we can trust, the word that we can trust. So we're called to repent, to change our thinking. And then we have the noun of that, which is repentance. Repentance is reformation of your thought life. When you change the way you think, and you continue to change the way you think, then you have a reformation of your thought life. You no longer think the same way anymore. It's been reformed. It's been renewed. Be renewed by the washing of the Word. Be renewed by the Word of God. We need to be renewed. So repent is the most important word you're going to find in the Bible. And it deals with this. You look at James, you look at Peter, and you look at Paul, and you look at Jesus teach all on this. Humble yourself in the sight of God that he may exalt you. See, we want to be exalted. We want to be lifted up. But we're not going to do that unless we want to humble ourselves. And how do we humble ourselves? We yield our will to his will. And how do we do that? We change the way we think. We repent. We change the way we think. We repent. And when we do that, we can line ourselves up with the will of God. Because that's what it's all about, is learning. Now, this is not a one-time... You know, you get born again and everything, you know everything about God and, and you don't ever need to do this again. Matter of fact, there is a teaching right now that says that you only repent once. You repent one time when you get born again and God forgives you of your sins in the past, present, and the future. And so you never have to repent again. There's a big problem with that, a huge problem with that. And that is change brings growth. And if you never change you never grow. So if you never repent, you never change, you never grow. And so you stay as a baby, a baby Christian, a selfish little baby Christian. And But we're not called to do that. We're called to repent and grow. Repent and change and grow. Reform our thinking. That's why that word is so vital, so important. So let's move on from there. So we have. So it starts with a powerful word, repent. Repent. Change the way you think. Repent 
therefore, and be converted. Now, I was taught that the word repent meant you're going one way, I need you to turn 180 degrees and go the opposite direction. But that's not what the word repent means. We just talk about what the word repent means. It means change the way you think. Change the way you think. That's what it means. Change the way you think. The word converted means to go from one direction, go the opposite direction, 180 degrees. The word converted means that. But notice what comes before you're converted. Repent. Change your will. Line your will up. Yield your will to the will of God. Yield your will to the Word of God. And then your actions will change. See, they, they come together. They're, they're in unison. The end there means in unity or in unison with. So if you are repentant, truly repentant, you change your will, you reform your thinking, then your actions will show that reformation. If you were going on this direction, you're going the opposite direction now. The actions will be represented because of the decision you made from repentance. Repent, change the way you think, so that you go 180 degree direction the other way. So it says, repent, therefore, and be converted, so what? That your sins may be blotted out so that your sins may be obliterated. So when you have repented and you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you were walking in this direction, you turned around and your life has changed and you walk in a different direction, then your sins have been obliterated, not just covered over. They're not just covered over. They are obliterated. Now, God sets this up. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come. Now, he sets it in a time period. He says, I want you to do this so you're ready. I want you to repent, and I want you to have your sins forgiven. I want you to be converted so that you're ready for what's coming up. What's coming up? So from here, it says, when the times of refreshing shall come. From when the time of refreshing shall come. When the times of refreshing shall come. Let's take the word times. There are two types of time. There is man time and there is God time. Man time and God time. Man time is a linear line. It's a linear timeline, chronos timeline. We get the word chronological from it. When man fell... From the Garden of Eden, from perfection, he fell from a high place to a low place. He fell from eternal time into linear time. And there became a countdown. It, it's linear. It just goes in a straight line. So it has a start point, the fall of man, and it has an end point when the end of man is all finished. So there's going to be a start, there's going to be a finish, and it's a straight line. Just the same way as our lives have a straight line to it. You were born into this world, that's the start, and you're going to die in this world. And that's the end. It's a linear line. That's man's time. But this word that we see here, the times are refreshing. It's not man's time, but it's God's time. It's kairos. The word is kairos. And think of it as a sphere, a sphere of time. It's not a linear time. It's a sphere of time that God operates in. In other words, there is no beginning, therefore there is no end to it. So God is saying here that it's His time. So it's saying there are times of refreshing. The word refreshing literally means revival. There are times of revival. God is appointed in His, his sphere of eternal time. There are times of revival. Now we know that the greatest revival that we've had so far is the very first one. The very first revival, which came 10 days after Jesus was taken up, raptured. Remember, Jesus' ministry did not end at his death on the cross. It did not end there. I know sometimes we think that way, but it's not true. Jesus' ministry did not end there. It didn't end until 40 days after he was resurrected. 
Jesus ministered on the earth for 40 days. Jesus ministered for 40 days after he was resurrected in a glorified body. He ministered to his disciples. He ministered to his people. He ministered to his followers for 40 days. There was ministry going on for 40 days. And after the 40th day, he was taken up. He was raptured into heaven. After he was raptured into heaven, 10 days later, just 10 days, 10 days later, the day of Pentecost came. The day of Pentecost came. And 3,000 people went added to the church. Within weeks, there were tens of thousands of believers in the church. Tens of thousands of believers. I really highly recommend that you read um, Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 1 to 5. And you'll see that revival. You'll see a revival that is the greatest revival that we've had on the earth. There's been many revivals, many big revivals, but nothing like this yet. And remember this, how God starts is how he finishes. Always does that. How God starts is how he finishes. When God started the world, he started it in perfection. Adam and Eve were in perfection. And he's going to finish it in the same way, in perfection. How he starts is how he finishes. So he's saying, you need to be ready. You need to repent. You need to have reformation of your thought life. You need to convert your life and convert your actions so that they're lined up with what you're repenting from and what you've changed your mind to. So that when the God times of revival shall come, how shall they come? How shall they come? From the presence of the Lord. How shall they come? There's no revival that comes from outside of the presence of the Lord. It's all from the presence of the Lord. And that interesting, because that word presence, you know, you could be in a church service, and the presence of God could be there. And you could have two people side by side. One senses the presence of God, and one doesn't. But that's not the kind of the presence that he's talking about here. The word literally means front of the face or front of the visage. You visibly see the front of him. In other words, it's not kind of there, it's there, very obviously there. So it comes from the very obvious presence, the very obvious presence of the Lord. This revival, this God-ordained times of revival comes specifically from the presence, the very obvious presence of the Lord. Now he gives it away in verse Verse 20, he tells us what this is. Very clearly tells us. And he, God, shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you. How is the face of, the, of this revival going to be seen? Because he sends Jesus unto us. How are we going to know the face of the presence of God, the very apparent presence of God in, in revival? This God-ordained revivals, and then there's revivals because... There's, there's many revivals that we've had, but there are, there are certain events, like the first one, the day of Pentecost, and then the next one that's coming, that are events, and then there are many revivals in between that don't reach the same magnitude of that, these first and this last revival. But it's from the very obvious presence, and who it is that? That's Jesus appearing, God sending Jesus Again, God sending Jesus to us. Verse 21, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. In whom the heaven must receive. In whom the heavens must receive. Now, it doesn't mean hold back. Heaven's not holding Jesus back. That's not what that means. The heaven has received Jesus. When Jesus was resurrected, Mary seen him. He said, don't touch me. I haven't yet gone to my Father. In other words, I have not yet been received into heaven. And he presented himself. He presented his sacrifice, presented his blood. And then he came back for 40 days to prove this. He would be in the earth preaching. He would have been up in heaven, received in heaven, back down to the earth, preaching into the heaven, received. 
into the heavens. He is received into the heavens right up to today. He is received until the times of restitution. The word times here against plural and the times here is natural time, chronological time, the linear time. There's a timeline of restitution that the Bible clearly, clearly puts in, in, into the Word. Very clearly you can read it and see it. There's a timeline. There's a timeline for the age of grace to end. A seven-year period of the restitution of judgment that's based on the law of Moses for seven years. That's why the temple is being rebuilt for that purpose. For judgment and then when that judgment comes Jesus returns sets up his kingdom for 1,000 years but it doesn't go forever it goes for a thousand years and at the end of that thousand years everything is changed that thousand years we talk about we can see it in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 you'll read about it there it, it very clearly states about what that is matter of fact let's go there let's go to 1st Corinthians chapter 15 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go um, verse 23. So if you have 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That's what he's going to do for a thousand years. Then the last enemy shall be destroyed is death for he hath put all things under his feet but when he saith all things he are put under him it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him and when all things are subdued unto him unto Jesus then shall the son also himself be subject unto him unto God the Father that has put all things under him that God may be all in all so that's what he's talking about in Acts chapter uh, 3 that period right here. That period when everything is subdued unto Jesus, he literally comes up with overcoming physical death. When that time hits, the end of the thousand years hits, Satan is loose for a short period of time. He is destroyed by God and there's a new heaven and new earth. The age of man is done. Remember there's a linear time. The age of man started at the fall and it will go until the age of man is done when Jesus restores all things, which is finding that cure to death. And when he does that, a thousand years is done. So it's very clearly put in scripture of that time period. The age of man, the linear age time, the chronological time, is clearly put into it at the end of the restitution of all things. So let's go back to Acts. Find Acts. Chapter 3, verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times, the man times, the times, the linear time, of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his prophets since the world began. Peter talks about it. James talks about it. Paul talks about it. They all talk about this time of restitution of all things. See, God is interested how he starts is how he finishes. How he starts is how he finishes. The Lord started on the day of Pentecost. Ten days after Jesus was raptured, the day of Pentecost came. Within weeks, there were tens of thousands of believers. Again, I encourage you to read chapter 1 to 5 in Acts. Read it over a few times, 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. And there's a different feel for the first five chapters of the book of Acts than there is for the rest of the book of Acts. It, it's literally heaven on earth that happens for 10 days. And then, or for, for, for those period, five, five chapters, it's, it's literally what you'll see is heaven on earth for those, for those five chapters. 
and how God starts is how he's going to complete it. You're going to see that again. And that's what the Lord is talking about here. And that's what he says. Repent. Change the way you think. Be converted. If you're going the wrong way, turn around and go the other way. Your actions will demonstrate themselves if you've actually literally repented. Change the way you think. So you have reformation of your thought life. You think like Jesus thought. You have the mind of Christ, the Bible says, so you can do this. You have the mind of Christ. But you have to purpose in yourself to follow Jesus. You have to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. My goal is to make you hungry. If I can get you hungry, then you're going to go and you're going to search. I'm going to give you enough of the puzzle so you can figure it out, but I'm not necessarily going to give you all the puzzle. You need to go find the wrath of the final puzzle pieces for yourself. So I encourage you, Jesus is Lord. Go and learn and find out about this Lord, this Master, this, this Jesus of Nazareth that willingly left heaven and came down the earth for you and for me. It's worth the search. It's the greatest search you'll ever do. Till next week, Jesus is Lord. God bless you.